that these neurotransmitter-like substances are out there in the plant kingdom or the fungal kingdom or even the animal kingdom uh, is not as remarkable as the fact that, you know, indigenous people living immersed in these highly chemically diverse ecologies have become, uh, you know, very clever about discovering these things and figuring out how to use them, you know, in their shamanic traditions. And this is, you know, this in some way is more remarkable than the fact that the compounds are there. It's that people have uh, evinced a lot of ingenuity in digging these things out and figuring out how to make them active. Like, for example, again, DMT is a very powerful psychedelic, but it is not orally active. So you can eat plants all day that contain DMT and nothing will happen because it's inactivated, as you know, by an enzyme in the gut called monoamine oxidase. And, uh, but indigenous people have figured out that there are also plants that contain monoamine oxidase inhibitors and they've figured it out through trial and error or whatever that if you combine a plant containing DMT with a plant containing a monoamine oxidase and MAO inhibitor, then it becomes very active. And how did they figure that out? Was it through trial and error? Not so clear, you know, because there are many plants out there and many potential combinations. So how did they figure that out? Nobody really knows. Uh, you know, but the point is they, they were, you know, motivated enough to seek out uh, these altered states that they actually did figure it out. They approached it, I don't know how, either accidentally, which seems unlikely, or through trial and error, which seems also <laughs> unlikely. Um, who knows how they figured it? Maybe animals do this thing. Maybe they watch animals. I mean, what they will tell you, as you know, in South American traditions, you say, how did you figure out how to combine, you know, Banisteriopsis bark, which contains the MAO inhibitor, with the leaves of, of Chacruna, which contains DMT, and come up with this very powerful orally active psychedelic? They will say, well, the plants, the plants told us how to do this. And you know, as a Westerner, you just scratch your head and you say, well, that's ridiculous, you know, I've never heard such a ridiculous thing. But they'll always tell you that, you know. So, who knows, you know. There does seem to be, uh, in some way, I mean, the, the shamans and other people that use these things will say, you know, uh, half the reason they take these, it's not just to induce altered states, it's to learn things. And a lot of what they like to learn, uh, a lot of the reason they take them is to learn about the properties of plants. You know, what they're good for, what their biodynamic properties are, what they might be used to treat or cure, or, or what their psychoactive effects are. So a lot of what motivates the shaman, I think, in their relationship to nature is the same thing that motivates scientists. The shaman is a kind of scientist. It's curiosity, you know. They want to know, what does this plant do? You know, and what does this plant do if I combine it with this plant, you know? So it's really a very experimental approach that they're taking to, to all this. And uh, they do learn, and, and I think that one thing that shaman do, and if, again, if you look at the ayahuasca tradition, one thing that they do is, uh, in exploring these altered states, uh, they have become very adept at sort of monitoring their own inner landscape and their own physiological state. So, you know, they sort of have a baseline uh, you know, we, they know what the baseline, you know, state of ayahuasca is. And then if they put another plant in there, in that mix that they want to investigate, they can see how does that move the experience away from baseline 
So in some ways they can acquaint themselves with what that plant might do in, in a very sort of hands-on, direct, experimental uh, way. And uh, I think uh, that that's a lot of, uh, of what goes on in, in this kind of shamanism. This is how this pharmacopoeia gradually built up over, you know, uh, centuries, essentially through experimentation, through experimental, like empirical um, bioassay, if you will. Well, I do. Uh, actually, I do personally think that it, uh, that it did. And I think that a lot of what is coming out of uh, sort of the frontiers of, uh, of neuroscience right now supports that. You know, we now have these brain imaging tools and these sophisticated tools, so we can look at people, uh, what's happening in their brains when they are in profoundly altered states of consciousness, either on psychedelics or in you know, in, in mystical uh, states of various types or deep meditation, we can actually see what part of the brain is lighting up in a word and mediating these things. So I think, I mean, just last week there was a whole new study published about how they've located, you know, what they're calling the God spot. You know, so the brain is architecturally and physiologically set up to experience these transcendent states. And certain drugs will activate them and certain practices will activate these brain areas. And there's a lot of overlap, for example, between, uh, you know, the areas of the brain that are activated by psilocybin, which is one of the ones that's been looked at and uh, deep meditation, you know, there's a lot of overlap. So uh, I do think that, you know, uh, the, the spiritual experience is kind of built into the human brain. And the larger question is, or the, the more interesting question is, why should it be? And what is the use of that? What is the... What is the evolutionary advantage of being able to have transcendent experiences? Or is there one? You know?